Hi, this is Len Furman, the Sports Time Traveler, with one of the most personally fulfilling episodes I've ever written. It's titled, Dr. J, Mr. K, and Super John. A trio of exciting new players take the 1974 New York Nets to the ABA Finals. I start with an introduction from the Sports Time Traveler. The Nets are the only pro basketball team which have lost at least 30 games in every year of their existence in the NBA, not including the COVID-shortened seasons. Sadly, this was the team I started to root for in 1977 when they moved from Long Island to my backyard in central New Jersey. I had been a committed Knicks fan for as long as I could remember. The Knicks were in their heyday in the early 1970s, having won two titles and coming within a basket of making four straight trips to the NBA Finals. But I just had to become a Nets fan in 1977 because it was the first time we ever had a major professional sports team in New Jersey, and they were playing right near my home in the New Brunswick area. In the New Jersey Nets' first four seasons, From 1977 to 1981, my dad and I went to 162 of the 164 home games. After I went to college, my mom and dad continued to go to most of the games, even after they moved farther away to the Meadowlands to play. During their entire 35-year stay in New Jersey, the Nets never won a title and only reached the conference finals and NBA finals twice in 2002 and 2003 during the Jason Kidd era. But their legacy in the old ABA was a little different. In the final three years of the league, from 1973 to 1976, the Nets were an elite team with one of the most breathtaking players in the history of the game, Dr. J. Julius Irving. But I missed it almost entirely, as did many New York area hoops fans because we were still basking in the afterglow of the Knicks title teams with their lockdown defense, their finely open man style of team play, and the coolness of Clyde, all-star guard Walt Frazier. That makes this trip back in time 50 years to experience the Nets' first season with Dr. J, an extra special and personally fulfilling trip for the sports time traveler. And it's also a story I'm dedicating to my dad, who has never experienced the Nets win a championship. Background. On Wednesday, August 1st, 1973, the New York Times had an atypically tiny page one story. The article consisted of just one sentence. The New York Nets, in the most significant trade in their six-year history, have acquired Julius Irving, the American Basketball Association's leading scorer from the Virginia Squires. That same day, Julius Irving, a Long Island native, made an appearance at the fabled Rucker Basketball Tournament in Manhattan, which was documented in the August 2, 1973, New York Daily News. Phil Pepe's article was titled, Dr. J, He Really Operates, and it captures the legend that Julius Irving had already become before he played his first professional game for the New York Nets. In the article, Pepe quotes basketball aficionado Peter Vesey, who covered the Rucker. Quote, it was an amazing thing. Here was Dr. J, out of shape. He hadn't played a game in months, and for five solid minutes he went into his act and put on the greatest show you've ever seen. Pepe then follows that up with more superlatives about Dr. J. When Dr. J goes into his act, it is like nothing else in the world. He has all the moves ever invented, and a lot that were never invented. He rebounds the ball with his back to the hoop, and in one motion stuffs the ball backwards. Then there is the flying dunk, starting from the foul line, soaring in the air, and jamming the ball in the hoop. Also the up in the air, switching the ball from one hand to another, through his legs, and other moves that defy description, simply because they defy gravity and belief. Later in the article, Phil Pepe writes, Dr. J is coming. It seemingly couldn't be more exciting for New York basketball. 
The Knicks had just been crowned NBA world champions a few months earlier, defeating Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, and the Los Angeles Lakers in just five games in the finals. And now, 23-year-old Dr. J. Julius Irving was coming back home to New York. Irving had left home five years earlier, in the fall of 1968, to play basketball at the University of Massachusetts. In his junior year, he led UMass to a 23-4 record while averaging 27 points and 20 rebounds per game. Instead of returning for his senior year, he turned pro and signed with the ABA's Virginia Squires. In the 1972-73 season, he led the Squires and the entire ABA in scoring at 31.9 points per game. Now, he would return to New York to show off his electrifying style of play for the Nets, whose home was in Long Island, near where Irving grew up. How good was Julius Irving? It was not easy to judge since he played in the ABA, the upstart junior league of pro basketball, but there were many indications that Irving was deserving of the best player on the planet label. A few days after the deal to the Nets, Irving played in a summer pro all-star game in Los Angeles against UCLA alumni. The game included Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on the UCLA team and many other stars. Irving led all scorers with 31, and his team won it by 38. The August 6, 1973 Los Angeles Times noted that Irving poured in 31 points with an assortment of dazzling moves. The Long Beach Press-Telegram headline on the game read, Irving Steals Show. The article on the game included this passage. The biggest standing ovation came with 57 seconds left to play when the New York Nets' Dr. J capped his performance with an acrobatic left-handed hook. The Nets built a strong team around Irving. Six weeks later, the Nets made another move when they traded for rookie forward Larry Keenan. Like Irving, Keenan had left college after his junior year. He had recently led Memphis to the NCAA title game by averaging 20 points and 17 rebounds. And like Irving, 21-year-old Larry Keenan quit sky with the basketball. The Nets weren't done remaking their team. In training camp, they brought in yet another player who had left college early. Super John Williamson had averaged a nation-leading 39 points a game in his senior year in high school in 1970. He left New Mexico State after just two years, averaging 27 points per game in 1973. The team also had a serviceable center in Billy Paltz, a fourth-year player coming off an ABA All-Star season, and they had a bevy of point guards, including 1973 ABA Rookie of the Year Brian Taylor. The Nets brought in a rookie coach as well. Kevin Lochery had just retired in the NBA after a successful 11-year career. He had starred as a guard on the Baltimore Bullets team that went to the NBA Finals in 1971. Now, Lockery had the job of guiding the most spectacular player in the game and making all these new parts work around him together and make them work. The team was talented and young, very young. The average age of their starting five was under 23. It had all the makings of something big. But it didn't start out that way. In the first game of the season, Irving was brilliant, scoring 42 points on 19 for 36 shooting, grabbing 18 rebounds and blocking four shots. And Keenan had a double-double, 18 and 11, in his first pro game. But the Nets lost by 19 points at Indiana. Then there was an early season nine-game losing streak, which included three losses to the premier team in the ABA, the Kentucky Colonels, a team that had gone 124 and 44 over the prior two seasons. That loss, that losing streak, sank the Nets to a 4 and 10 record on November 10, 1973, while the Colonels led the ABA at 12 and 2. The losing contributed to an odd reception to the Nets superstar in Long Island. A December 4, 1973 New York Times article displayed the lagging attendance figures for the Nets at the 16,000-seat Nassau Coliseum. The team had not cracked the 10,000 ticket mark for any game of the new season thus far. But the Nets began to show signs of life when they reeled off nine straight wins beginning the end of November. In the second game of the streak, rookie guard John Williamson newly inserted into the starting lineup, showed his potential when he shot for 11 for 15 for 26 points. 
The streak also included a 15-point victory at Kentucky, in which rookie Larry Keenan had 18 points and 15 rebounds while holding all-star forward Dan Issel, who had averaged at least 27 points per game in each of the prior three seasons, to just 16 points on 6 for, eight shoot, six for 18 shooting. From that point on, the Nets were stellar, never losing more than three times in a row the remainder of the year. In mid-January, the Nets reached the pinnacle. A five-game winning streak gave the Nets a 30-17 and record, tops in the ABA. Still, less than 10,000 fans came out on a Friday night, January 11, 1974, to see the fifth consecutive win, a 109-106 thriller over Indiana in which Super John scored 35 to overcome a 29-point, 25-rebound performance by the Pacers' George McGinnis. But their latest winning streak did catapult Julius Irving to the cover of Sports Illustrated for the first time. And in the written version of the Substack article, you can see a link to the cover of that Sports Illustrated issue, which hit the newsstands on January 14, 1974. In the picture of Julia serving on the cover dunking the ball, you notice Mr. K, Larry Keenan, just to the left of Dr. J in the cover shot, skying equally as high as Irving. After that, Attendance started regularly topping 10,000 in the Nassau Coliseum. The Nets closed the season with another five-game winning streak and finished with a record of 55-29, and 29, good for the best record in the ABA. Following the 4-10 and 10 start, the Nets had gone 51-19 and 19 to close the season. No other team in the ABA or NBA had a winning percentage that high over the final 70 games of the 1974 season. Aside from Dr. J's otherworldly play, team defense was the Nets' biggest asset as they led the league in block shots and overall defensive rating and were second in the league in steals. In addition, all three members of the Nets' front court finished in the top 10 in the league rebounding stats. The Nets' starting five had meshed together into a force. Here were their stats. Julius Irving. 27 points per game, 11 rebounds, 5 assists, 2.3 steals, 2.4 blocks, 52% field goal shooting, 40% three-point field goal shooting. Billy Paltz averaged 16 points and 10 rebounds and 1.9 blocks. Larry Keenan averaged 15.9 points, 11 and, a half, and 11 and a half rebounds. John Williamson averaged 14 and a half points on 49% shooting. And Brian Taylor averaged 11 points, 4.5 assists on 48% shooting. The stats on Julius Irving are particularly noteworthy. He became the only player ever in the ABA or NBA to have a season in which he averaged over 25 points, 10 rebounds, 5 assists, 2 steals, and 2 blocks. No one else in the annals of the ABA or NBA comes close to matching those stats for a single season. And compared to his ABA competition, Irving was dominant. He led the league in scoring. He was seventh in rebounding, fourth in assists, third in steals, third in blocks, ninth in field goal percentage, and first in three-point field goal percentage for all players with at least 40 attempts. There is a strong case to be made for Dr. J as having had the greatest individual season in American professional basketball history in 1974. Needless to say, Julius Irving won the ABA's MVP award. Larry Keenan and John Williamson finished third and fourth in Rookie of the Year voting. Near the end of the regular season, the New York Times celebrated the great season by Dr. J. In an article on March 21, 1974, the Times' Dave Anderson wrote a piece titled, Dr. J is Leaping to Greatness. In the article, Anderson describes an overtime game that had taken place a few days earlier on March 16, 1974 at Kentucky, in which Irving scored 11 of the Nets' final 13 points. With 13 seconds to play in overtime and the score tied, Nets coach Kevin Lachery told his team, everybody clear out and let Doc go one-on-one. Irving ran the clock down to one second, took a 15-foot jump shot, and won the game at the buzzer. Dr. J told Anderson, that's, part of, that's the part of the game I really loved as a kid. 
that challenge of daring to be great. The playoffs begin. In the first round of the playoffs, the Nets easily disposed of Irving's old team, the Virginia Squires, four games to one. All four Nets victories were by double digits. In the only loss, the Nets rallied from a 10-point deficit with 2.30 to play to cut the Squires' lead to one point with 23 seconds left. Then they got the ball back with eight seconds left. Brian Taylor passed to Irving on the baseline. He drove for a game-winning layup and missed, giving the Squires their lone series victory. Irving gave no excuses for the miss, according to Doug Smith in the April 5, 1974 edition of Newsday. It was proof for many Nets fans that Dr. J was, in fact, human. The series win over Virginia set up a showdown between the New York Nets and the Kentucky Colonels for the Eastern Division Championship. The Kentucky Colonels held the best record in the ABA over the prior three seasons combined. They featured a core of three future Hall of Famers who had played together for three seasons and were all in their prime. Two of them made up one of the greatest ever power forward center combinations. Artis Gilmore is the number five all-time rebounder in pro basketball. And Dan Issel is the number 13 all-time scorer in pro basketball. In addition, Colonel shooting guard Louis Dampier was the ABA's all-time leading scorer. This series would define the season for the Nets. Were they contenders or pretenders? Could they be the best team in the ABA? Or were they really a year or two away, not mature enough to win the big games against the best teams when it really counted? Naturally, as the sports time traveler, I just had to go back and experience the Nets versus Colonel series. I had to see my Nets playing in one of the biggest playoff series in franchise history, and one that I didn't pay attention to when I was a kid because the Knicks were playing the Celtics in the NBA's Eastern Conference Finals at the same time after the Knicks had defeated the Capitol Bullets in a thrilling seven-game series. This virtual trip began last month. Game one was on Saturday, April 13th, 1974. Here are my reports from my recent sports time travels. New York, New York Nets versus Kentucky Colonels. Game one, Uniondale, Long Island, April 14th, 1974. Last night, I was at the Nassau Coliseum virtually to experience game one of the Eastern Division Finals between the Nets and Colonels. You can experience the game as I did by watching this YouTube video for which I've included the link in the written version of the Substack article. Here's my commentary with the timestamps from the video. As the video begins, you see highlights of Dr. J's play during the season. If you watch nothing else, check out the first 50 seconds of the tape. This is Julius Irving at the height of his athletic ability before his knees caused him to play more cautious and with less pizzazz later on during his NBA career in Philadelphia. At 3.33 is the opening tip of Game 1. At 8.52 on the tape, Irving hits a mid-range bank shot over Dan Issel. Early in his career, Irving had a deadly mid-range jumper. At the 10.57 mark on the tape, Artis Gilmore, one of the great centers of all time, hits a turnaround jumper off the glass over the top of Nets center Billy Pauls. At 11.10 on the tape, Pauls immediately returns the favor, hitting a tough jumper in the lane over the 7-2 Gilmore. At 14.25, Louis Dampier tosses in a rare three-pointer. Dampier led the league in three-point field goal percentage for all players with more than 50 attempts, but he only attempted 1.5 three-pointers per game in 1974. At the 16-minute mark, after Artis Gilmore misses an old-style sweeping hook shot, Dan Issel demonstrates his toughness, snaring the rebound and hitting on a fallaway jumper all in one motion. At the 40-32 mark, watch as Super John Williamson gets the ball on the far side of the court. He battles with Louis Dampier and finds a way to get just enough space to hit a tough double pump shot. At 40-55 on the tape, Dan Issel takes the opening tip of the fourth quarter and drives it all the way to the hoop. At 50-12 on the tape, Paltz throws an alley-oop pass to Irving for a tip-in. At 52 minutes flat on the tape, 
Dr. J skies for a baseline jumper while being double teamed. At 5308 on the tape, Mr. K, Larry Keenan, grabs an offensive rebound and stuffs it. The Nets won the game 119 to 106, as Irving scored 23 of his 35 points in the second half. Keenan had 20 points and 15 boards, and Super John had 17 on 7 for 12 shooting. Nets versus Colonels Game 2, April 15, 1974. The Nets also won Game 2 by an even wider margin, 99 to 80. The Nets did it by holding Issel and Gilmore to a combined 9 for 31 shooting, while Irving went 12 for 23 for 27 points to lead all scorers, and Keenan registered another double-double. Nets versus Colonels Game 3, April 17, 1974. With the Nets up two games to none, this set up a crucial Game 3 in Kentucky for the Colonels. On their home court, Kentucky raced out to a 15-point first quarter lead. They led 54-45 at halftime and had a 10-point lead at 81-71 early in the fourth quarter. But the Nets came back, and the game was tied at 87 with 17 seconds to play. It was the Nets' ball coming out of a timeout, and everyone in the building and in the entire state of Kentucky knew who the Nets were giving the ball to. Doug Smith of of Newsday wrote about Julius Irving. There was no telephone booth handy, so he couldn't change into the Man of Steel. Yet that seems to be what Julius Irving does each time Kevin Lockery calls his please pull us out of this one, Dr. J, play. When the play started, Irving got the ball and stood near midcourt until there were four seconds remaining. Then he began to surgically thrust through the colonel's defense. Smith wrote, Irving dribbled past Bradley, maneuvered around Gilmore, and went up on a running jumper that swished through the strings at the buzzer. The Nets won it, 89-87. Irving's buzzer beater gave gave him an even 30 for the game. Keenan had 21 points and 9 rebounds, missing his third straight double-double by one board. The Nets had won it despite Issel and Gilmore combining for 41 points and 45 rebounds. It was a crushing loss for Kentucky. After the game, Dr. J told Smith, that's what I'm getting paid for. Artis came out after me, and I think he figured I was going to shoot from the top of the key. He came out real hard and committed himself. Then I was gone. Smith continued in his article writing, gone too? may be the Colonel's hopes of winning the series. Smith titled his article, The Old Last Gasp Trick, because he had seen it from Dr. J so many times. Nets versus Colonels, Game 4, April 20th, 1974. Game 4 turned into a laugher for the Nets. The Nets forged an 18-point lead at 61-43 and let 64-49 at halftime. They were never threatened in the second half. The Nets ran up the lead to 76-53 in the third quarter and won it 103-90. Irving led all scorers with 27 on 13 for 22 shooting. Artis Gilmore had a great game for Kentucky with 20 points and 20 rebounds on 9 for 13 shooting, but his front court mate Dan Issel was held to just 5 for 15 shooting by Larry Keenan. The Nets had swept the Kentucky Colonels. It was a magnificent achievement for the young Nets team. The 1974 ABA Finals, New York Nets versus Utah Stars, April 30th, 1974. The Nets now had 10 days until the start of the ABA Finals against the Utah Stars on April 30th. On Sunday, April 28th, 1974, Dr. J took the time to lead 20,000 school children on a 20-mile walkathon to benefit the March of Dimes. He was building a legend. The walk must have warmed up Irving just perfectly because two days later on April 30th, Dr. J poured in 47 of the Nets' 89 points and the Nets beat the Stars 89-85 to in Game 1 of the ABA Championship. Irving was at his best, hitting 19 of 29 for his highest scoring performance of the entire 1974 season. It was also one of the few times in history that a single player scored over 50% of his team's points in an ABA or NBA playoff game. 
Larry Keenan was sharp as well, hitting 9 of 15 for 20 points and 18 rebounds. The rest of the team shot just 11 for 44, with Super John connecting on just 2 of 12 shots. In the New York Times, Dave Anderson described a novel play by Dr. J as part of his 47-point performance. Quote, on 45 of those points, his teammates reacted casually. They had seen all the shots before, the slam dunks, the floating layups, the twisting jump shots. But the other two points were something special. Dr. J was loping around the left corner in front of the Nets bench when he started to drive the baseline. But he was being angled out of bounds by Bruce Seals, the six-foot, nine-inch forward guarding him. Although far behind the plane of the backboard, Dr. J sprang high, reached out with the ball in his right hand, and flicked it over Seals' outstretched hand, past the side of the backboard, and through the orange rim. On the bench, his stunned teammates snapped their heads from side to side. Some even shrieked, woo, woo, the way small boys might. His teammates hadn't seen that move before. It was just a one-handed shot, Dr. J explained later. The iconic baseline scoop. I interrupt this article for a minute to share a story about a similar move by Dr. J many years later. There is no video of Dr. J's move in game one of the 1974 ABA finals that I just described. That was described by, above by Dave Anderson in the New York Times. But it reminds me of the greatest play I've ever seen in pro basketball, a play by Dr. J eight years later during the 1982 NBA Finals. And you can watch that one in the video, a short, very short three-minute video I've included in the written version of the Substack article. It came in a game in the championship against the loss between the Philadelphia 76ers, for which Irving played, and the Los Angeles Lakers. My favorite part of the video is where Magic Johnson, who played in the game, described his reaction at the time to what happened. And you can see Magic Johnson describing that at the 110 mark on the tape when Johnson says, he thought to himself, should we ask him to do it again? We've never seen anything like that before. Now back to the 1974 ABA Finals. 1974 ABA Finals Game 2, May 4th, 1974. In Game 2, Irving was brilliant again. The Nets took a 61-37 lead at halftime and won it 118-94. Irving scored 32 on 12 for 19 shooting. 1974 ABA Finals Game 3, May 6th, 1974. In Game 3 in Utah, the Nets were on their way to a double-digit win when the Stars, playing at home, climbed back from 15 points down with eight minutes to play to take a three-point lead. Then, Brian Taylor sank a three-point shot at the buzzer to send the game to overtime, tied at 94. In the overtime, the Nets took a 100-98 lead when, according to Leonard Coppett of the New York Times, Irving took over. He cleared a key defensive rebound, followed his own missed shot for a spectacular rebound basket, got another rebound, and sank a free throw. That made the score 103 to 98 with eight seconds left. The Nets were now up three games to none in the championship. 1974 ABA Finals Game 4, May 8, 1974. Utah avoided being swept on their home court with a 97 89 win. That enabled the Nets to come back home and possibly win the championship in front of their own fans. 1974 ABA Finals Game 5, May 10th, 1974. Game 5 was tight for three quarters, and then the Nets broke it open and won it, 111 to 100. The scoring was more evenly distributed, with all five scorers scoring at least, all five starters for the Nets scoring at least 15 points. And for the first time since the opening round of the playoffs, Irving was not the leading scorer. Dr. J was held to 21 on 7 for 13 shooting, while Mr. K had 25 points and 11 boards as he went 10 for 16 from the field, and Super John had 21 on 7 for 14 shooting. It was a team win, and it was an ABA title for the New York Nets. It portended the possibility that this could be the start of a dynasty, if you will. After all, Irving 
had signed an eight-year contract with the Nets, and none of the starters was older than 25. The champagne flowed freely in the locker room, according to Doug Smith of Newsday. They gulped down champagne in big swallows and poured the rest of it on each other and anyone else within range. The victory was the culmination of an extraordinary season for the youngest basketball team ever to win a professional basketball title. And at the same time, it could be the beginning of another New York dynasty, replacing the aging Knickerbockers. The next day, May 11, 1974, a giant banner headline was plastered on the back of the New York Daily News, which read, Nets Champs. The sports time traveler finally got to experience the Nets winning a championship. Postscript. There was no Super Bowl of basketball in 1974. That begged the question, could the 1974 ABA champion New York Nets have beaten the 1974 NBA champion Boston Celtics? The question was actually debated 50 years ago this week in a fascinating Newsday article by Pete Alfano that appeared on May 14, 1974. Alfano posed the question to several NBA and ABA head coaches. Johnny Egan, head coach of the NBA's Houston Rockets, and Casey Jones, head coach of the NBA's Capital Bullets, and a guard on many of the past Celtics title teams, both felt the Nets would have no chance against the Celtics. Jones provided that assessment, despite the fact that the Nets had beaten the Bullets in the preseason. Gene Shu, head coach of the Sixers, was a little less protective of the NBA's position. He felt that the Nets could compete with the top teams in the NBA, as he said, Looking at the Nets, they have the personnel, speed, and quickness. There isn't any reason why they couldn't. But Tom Nasaki, head, head coach of the ABA San Antonio Spurs, thought Boston would beat the Nets, quote, because they are a better all-around team, which has played together for a while and blended well. Although I would take Irving over any Celtics player. Al Bianchi, head coach of the ABA's Virginia Squires, was the biggest proponent of the Nets' chances to beat the Celtics. He said, quote, I don't see why not. They beat Kentucky four straight. They can play pressure defense, too. Everyone talks about Boston's pressure, but they were pressuring Oscar Robertson, whom the Celtics beat in the NBA Finals. A 35-year-old man, that's not pressure. Bianchi then summed up the consensus view of how the Nets would fare against the Celtics. The Nets wouldn't be embarrassed. Maybe you'd call it a surprise. Two days later, on May 16, 1974, Celtics great John Havlicek and Julius Irving were both posed the question of which team would win in a head-to-head -head matchup. The two star players were together at the Plaza Hotel in Midtown Manhattan to receive the Sport Magazine Finals MVP awards for their respective leagues. In an article in the New York Times by Sam Goldieper, both players preferred to avoid the question about which team would win. Havlicek's initial reaction was, games like that don't prove anything. Loath to be required to play yet another series pitting the NBA winners versus the ABA winners, Havlicek lamented that, quote, the season is just too long. We'd be better off with a shorter season. Goldaper reported that neither star was eager to do any more playing. They suggested that Kevin Lockery, the Nets coach, and Tom Heinsohn, the Celtics coach, could meet in a game of one-on-one. -on -one. And so the question of who had the very best team in the world of pro basketball will have to wait until the ABA and NBA finally merge. But it is interesting to note that prior to the 1974 season, back in September and October of 1973, there were 25 exhibition games played between ABA and NBA teams. ABA teams won 15 of the 25 games. Included in that was one game in which the Nets beat the defending champion New York Knicks. And you can read about that in an article I published last year titled uh, about about how the Nets defeated the NBA champion Knicks. The link to that is in the written version of the Substack article. The Sports Time Traveler will continue following the New York Nets for the remainder of their time in the ABA. Thanks for listening, and please share the Sports Time Traveler.